Greetings. Today we have the privilege of visiting with Morton Klein, the president of the Zionist Organization of America, an organization with over 30,000 members and which has grown tremendously in the past two decades of Morton's leadership. And with me as well is Bob Cohn, editor-in-chief emeritus. So in the news today in Israel is reaction to the report of the Levy Committee about the uh, legality and le legitimacy of settlements in the, in the West Bank. Um, and the committee appears to have generally accepted that the Israeli settlement occupation of Judea and Samaria is lawful and the land be belongs to Israel. Though the report apparently is in fact critical of some of the ways that settlements were developed without lawful permits and the like. Mm -hmm. This morning, Jeffrey Goldberg mm -hmm. had a very interesting comment in his blog um, that he's, he's not sure those who support the decision understand its legal consequence, and I thought we could talk about if the land belongs to Israel and the occupants of the mm -hmm. land, both Palestinians mm -hmm. and Israelis, mm -hmm. are all entitled to the privilege of citizenship, <coughs> including voting and other individual protections, what does this mean? First of all, it is incorrect and inappropriate to use the word occupation. Reason is, you can only use the word occupation, it seems to me, if it's clearly someone else's legal, legal land, legal property. <laughs> you have to forgive me, I have Tourette syndrome. Uh, my father had it, I inherited it, unfortunately. So I make sounds I can't control. So uh, the problem. audience should know that that's what that's about. And, and by the way, since I haven't read the actual a full 92-page report, I cannot tell you whether the word occupation is actually used in the report or not. <laughs> well, but this even uh, goes to the issue of uh, legality. <laughs> in 1948 uh, was when the UN offered the second two-state solution. The first was the Peel Commission 37, where they offered 5% of the rest of Palestine that, that, uh, mm -hmm. that, that, was, uh, that wasn't given away. I can actually show you a map here. The Balfour Declaration gave away all of Palestine to the Jewish people in 1917 mm -hmm. because uh, England had legal control over all of it. And then in 1922-23, they temporarily <laughs> gave 80% of the original Palestine to King Abdullah and called it Transjordan because it's past mm -hmm. the Jordan River. So all that we're talking about is the 20% left of Palestine, and most people don't realize that. 80% of Palestine has already been given away to Jordan. In 1937, the Peel Commission offered 95% of the rest of Palestine to the Arabs, 5% to the Jews. The Arabs said no, when, even though the Jews were getting very little because they didn't want a Jewish state under any circumstances, no matter what the size. And in 48, was the second two-state solution where they, they, they essentially split the rest of Palestine in half. F actually, 46% to the Arabs, 54% to the Jews. The Arabs said, no way, Jose, and six Arab armies invaded the fledgling new state of Israel in order to destroy it and kill as many Jews as they could. <laughs> so once the Arabs said no, no longer did they have any legal right to that land that was legally given to them because they said no. Jordan actually came in, uh, invaded uh, the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, and illegally occupied it till 47. The UN never recognized that occupation. And in 1988, King Hussein of Jordan publicly stated he relinquishes any rights to Judea and Samaria, which means with Israel, Jews building and living in Judea and Samaria, this is unallocated international land, disputed. Uh, the Israelis actually have a stronger legal, political, and moral case, historical case for it than the Arabs, but the Arabs certainly do not have a legal case that it's theirs. They rejected it. <laughs> so, so let me, let me, since obviously we're not going to have time to go yeah. through the entire 60 <laughs> years, what, so what about this claim that if it in fact is part of Israel, how do you deal with the rights of all <laughs> Jews and <laughs> Palestinians and others who live there? <laughs> Look, even though Israel has a, the, the strongest legal, political, historic, and moral right to this land, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean they can't give it away. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that uh, they don't accept that they want to make, have an understanding with the Arabs of who gets what. That's why Israel's already given away 42%, almost half of the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, has been given to the Arabs under their own autonomy. The only thing they don't have autonomy over is security. That's why Israeli troops continue to be in there because terrorism continues. If there was no terrorism, there'd be no Israeli troops in Judea and Samaria. <laughs> uh, uh, so th Israel has, uh, has the right to give away what's theirs. They already have. And Israel is interested in giving away much more. In fact, in the year 2000 and 2008, Ehud Barak and Ehud Olmert, the two prime ministers, offered over 90% of Judea and Samaria to Arafat and then to Abbas, uh, uh, chunks of Jerusalem for a peace treaty. Uh, Arafat, uh, not only said no, he went to war, six, a, six, a six year terror war murdering 2,000 Jews. Abbas didn't even respond. So right now, 
It is disputed, unallocated international land that the Jews have a greater right to, but Israel is very willing to make major concessions, and they already have, if it will mean uh, a real peace. Uh, and there is discussions, if there is ever some sort of resolution, that the Palestinian Arabs who live in Judea and Samaria, those areas that Israel gives away where the Arabs live, and by the way, the areas that Israel's given away in Judea and Samaria mm -hmm. is where 99% of the Arabs live. 99%. <laughs> the other 58% Israel has not given away. Uh, Jews live on 5% of that land. The rest is uninhabited uh, land. Mm -hmm. People don't know that. <laughs> so there is discussion of the possibility. There's many discussions of many different possibilities. Uh, should one make the Palestinian Arabs who live in the land that's mm -hmm. been given away by Israel citizens of Jordan. Uh, there was discussion so the, the Arabs of Gaza be made citizens of Egypt. Now Israel's given away all of Gaza, so uh, they're not, there's nothing to discuss anymore. Uh, so as l until it remains disputed, uh, the, 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 the status of the Palestinian Arabs there is not clear, although they have every right and do vote in their own local elections. Uh, they don't vote in Jordanian elections. They don't vote in Israeli elections. Right. And uh, ultimately, there'll be a resolution, hopefully, to that Robert? problem. But do you think that there's any <laughs> merit, <laughs> as has been suggested, maybe Israel just sort of preemptively telling the Palestinians, you guys want to stay? We will recognize what you currently possess, what we've already allocated to you as an independent Palestinian state plus Gaza, coming to the United Nations, and our negotiations over borders will be between two sovereign states instead of between a state and an organization called the PLO, or the Palestinian Authority. Is there any merit to that <laughs> scenario? Uh -huh. I haven't understood that someone has been saying that. Has that been proposed? Well, I know that the European Union uh, well. suggested <laughs> that. And I, of course, uh, uh -huh. Well, there is someone. Well, Abbas <laughs> I mean, uh, also is seeking unilateral <laughs> right. recognition by the United uh -huh. Wouldn't it be a clever move on Israel's part, an adroit move, just to say, okay, we recognize what you currently have jurisdiction over as a, uh, as a Palestinian state, and just as the borders no. with Egypt weren't settled, we'll negotiate about borders. Uh, to give this state, this entity, it's not a state, this entity, the Palestinian Authority, <laughs> sovereignty, uh, an entity that continues to promote hatred and violence against Jews in their schools, their media, their speeches, their sermon, continues to name schools, streets, and sports teams after terrorists who have murdered Jews, continues to make public speeches. I'm talking about Mahmoud Abbas, Air Barakat, Abu Allah, uh, Sali, uh, Sari Naseba, that no Jew will be allowed to live in Palestine once there's a state. <laughs> horrifically racist statements, and the imams continue to state publicly that all the Jews must be killed. <laughs> what, so when you have a culture that continues to promote hatred and violence against Jews and the destruction of the Jewish state, as this culture does, it is a huge concession to, uh, to give them a sovereign state without a final resolution. So I think that should be held until there's a real resolution of all issues. That should be the last thing that happens, uh, uh, to be held in abeyance until <laughs> the Palestinian Authority makes it clear they accept Israel as a Jewish state, outlaws terrorist groups. Because <laughs> you're saying there's no expectation of safety or security. That's your point. But, I mean, no, in terms no, of not agreeing It's to worse it. than not expecting safety and security. It is clear there will not be safety and security. I was told by one of the top military people who I met with in Israel in March that 180 attempts of suicide bombings occurred last year. Virtually none of them um, uh, were successful because Israeli, Israeli soldiers in Judea and Samaria uh, caught, found the terror cells and stopped them from happening. So they're still doing everything they can to continue terrorist, terrorism against Israel. The reason it's quiet is because for the first time since 2000, 2001, Israeli soldiers are there uh, searching out terrorist cells. So no, they have not ended trying to hurt Israelis and destroy the state. Proof is they won't even say we accept the Jewish state within any borders. The issue is not borders. The issue is not borders. They've offered almost everything. The issue is, I'm sorry to say, Islamic Jew hatred. That not accepting a Jewish state within a any borders. In fact, I have a picture here of the most recent emblem. This is real. <laughs> Got it out of the Jerusalem Post. The most recent emblem that the Fatah party had commissioned. Taz, the ruling party in the Palestinian Authority, uh, under Mahmoud Abbas, whose chairman, uh, uh, the chairman of Fatah is Mahmoud Abbas. Look at this emblem. <laughs> A shape of all of Israel with an Arab kafia over all of it. Not just the West Bank and Gaza. All of it. A Kalishnikov rifle saying, you know, the struggle, terrorism, War continues, and a picture of the, one of the biggest Jew killers in the history, Yasser Arafat. Is this the emblem you commission as a Palestinian authority if you want to make peace with the Jewish state? 
And that's the faction that's been described as relatively moderate. This, this the, is, uh, is this, that's exactly, they're described as moderate. Is this a moderate emblem? When I asked Salam Fayyad personally, right to his face in Israel, we had a meeting, <laughs> how can he commission this if he wants peace with the Jewish state? He, f he went on rambling for many minutes, then I repeated the question, and he said, okay, uh, maybe we shouldn't have had this uh, emblem, but didn't apologize, didn't say I'm getting rid of it. Their goal is Israel's destruction. That's why no matter how gigantic the concessions are, it doesn't work because their enmity toward Jews has not ceased. And that's the real issue, tragically. Let's, um, let's move to another topic, um, <laughs> which is the fallout from the Israel High Court's ruling about the tall law um, relating to who must serve in the, in the military <laughs> and who is exempted. Um, so uh, there's a fair amount of political turmoil going on right now regarding this, relating to the strong public sentiment in Israel that all Jews, uh, including those currently exempt for religious uh, study, must be subject to mandatory military or community meaningful community service. Uh, so there was this Keshev committee report um, that made what seems to be fairly effective, reasonable suggestions on how to deal with this. Uh, and I guess yesterday, Netanyahu's Likud block talked about it, which made the Kadima folks happy that they were at least willing to talk about it, and there may be hope of a solution. Your, your thoughts both on what you think should happen and a prediction on what will happen. Uh, <laughs> Look, my position personally, ZOA, it's not really our issue. I understand. We've never taken a, a, an official you, you ZOA. You devote your stance, life to but talking I'm, about Israel. So but I, I'm, I will tell you, my view yeah. has always been, as it is to this minute, that every able-bodied man, certainly, maybe woman as well, <laughs> uh, should uh, give some service to the state, uh, whether it's military or communal. Absolutely. No one should be exempt from uh, the service to the state. Uh, with the Hasidim or the, uh, the ultra-Orthodox, <laughs> I'm told by military people it may be more trouble to accommodate their needs in the military uh, than it's worth, but if that is the case, they should do two years or three years of communal service, 100%. They're part of the country. They benefit from the country. They benefit from the country's army and security. They benefit from uh, you know, welfare and health insurance, whatever the country offers. They, uh, it is really unacceptable, intolerable for the ultra-Orthodox, who I respect. I'm deeply, I'm, I'm very pleased that there are a group of Jews who want to study Torah regularly. We need people to study Torah, uh, but they should not be exempt from uh, service to the country because they're studying Torah. So I support that position completely. Shifting to some other borders <laughs> with Israel, you have in Syria, it's now it's estimated 17,000 people have been killed. It was an announcement that <laughs> Russia has indicated they will no longer be shipping arms to help prop up Assad. You had elections in Egypt with a new Muslim Brotherhood President Mohammed Morsi, and then you had elections in Libya yesterday. Uh, what do you make of the, the so-called Arab Spring in terms of its net effect on Israel's security and peace in the region? <laughs> well, uh, what month? We're now in July. I was on many radio and TV shows in February of 2011 mm -hmm. when the so-called Arab Spring began. When every show. I said this will lead to disaster. I would be delighted to be wrong. And why did I say it would lead? It wasn't simply a vision I, that I had or uh, you know, s some prediction based on nothing. 92% of the Egyptians consider Israel an enemy. 92%. 75% believe that uh, Egypt should be a Sharia law state. <laughs> well over half, well over half believe the a uh, peace agreement between Israel and the Arabs should be rescinded, should be abrogated, canceled. The Egyptian press is one of the most anti-Semitic in the world, promoting hatred of Jews. So I knew that this was not a moderate country. This was a, a very bad culture that promotes hatred and violence against Jews and even America. When you have such a culture and you have elections, you're going to have elected bad people. You know, extremist, radical, uh, hostile people. And I believed, and I said so then, that the Muslim Brotherhood will likely come to power. The Muslim Brotherhood is an extremist radical group whose platform calls for jihad in every way, whose platform says men and uh, women and non-Muslims should not hold high office, who says that clerics, sheikhs, Islamic clerics should, should uh, decide on what laws are passed. And that's what you got. Just like in, in Gaza, we had a horrific culture there. They elected Hamas because that's their viewpoint. You only get, <clears throat> democracy will only bring you reasonable, uh, tolerant people if the culture is such. So the most important thing I always said is not to have elections, it's to transform the culture. After World War II, uh, the Allies worked hard for years 
to change the, the German textbooks, the TV, the radio, the speeches. They wouldn't let any Nazi come into power because they understood we've got to change the culture or you're going to keep, keep electing Nazis. And that's what happened in Germany. The, we, ha, we need, as George Will said, a denazification of many of these Arab countries. And only then will you get reasonable leaders. So no, this is not an Arab Spring. Instead of having Mubarak, a vicious and terrible dictator, a bad man, but who still tried to keep quiet between Israel and, the, and, the, and the Egypt, who, tried to, who was reasonably friendly to America. Now you have someone who is extremely hostile to America, who's uh, <laughs> this guy Morsi, who's publicly said we have to rethink uh, uh, the uh, agreements with Israel. Other Muslim Brotherhood leaders, the top leaders said we have to abrogate these agreements. Morsi was the head of two anti-Israel committees promoting hostility to Zionism. So this is a bad man. This is what you're going to get in the Arab world when the culture remains the same. The same will be true in Tunis, as we have a Muslim Brotherhood type there. In Libya, the Muslim Brotherhood on the verge of winning there. Elections won't work until the culture changes. Let's talk about what happened uh, this morning, which you may, since you've been traveling may or may not have facts on. As of about 40 <laughs> minutes ago, <laughs> the High Constitutional Court in Egypt uh, affirmed the military position on the <laughs> dissolution of the lower court of government. Um, dissolution uh, of the government. Yeah, correct, correct. So <laughs> what the military had basically enforced about a month ago, a <laughs> month and a half ago, the, uh, in which Morsi said he was going to unilaterally uh, basically undercut by yes. reinstating the lower right. court. The high court is now uh, sided with the military. Okay. So talk about how that, how that might play out in your opinion. <laughs> Except Look, it is true because I read it about 30 minutes well, ago. Well, I was in my car when this happened, <laughs> and because my wife did not inform me of it, I have no knowledge right. of this until you just okay. informed me, Mr. Levin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I can tell you I wasn't prepared to answer this question. Uh, Let's assume it is the true. The Egyptian and military has mm -hmm. said repeatedly, our principal enemy is Israel. Mm -hmm. This is a peace agreement. Mm -hmm. When the military says our principal enemy is Israel, mm -hmm. they've said it repeatedly to this very minute. So whether the military has more power or the Muslim brother has, my brother has more power, the mentality and the culture is such that both people have enormous en entity, enmity, enmity toward the Jewish Oh, no doubt, but nuances mm -hmm. do matter. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, from a pragmatic perspective, you know, uh, which way would you rather see things go? <laughs> Unless your position is oh, well, neither one will work. Well, look, uh, both people consider Israel the principal enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> The, 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 the danger, the big danger here is that the Egyptian military, and I've been told this by Israeli military mm -hmm. leaders as recently as this spring when I was in Israel, has arguably the most powerful army in the, in the Middle East, mm -hmm. the most sophisticated weapons, very well trained. Well trained by who? By the United States of America. Mm -hmm. Powerful army, great <laughs> weapons. Uh, why? Because America gives Egypt around $2 billion a year since the Camp David Agreement in 78-79. <laughs> so we in America built the greatest army. I was always worried about this, thinking if, if you get a radical regime coming back into power, they're going to have this great army. Israel, I can tell you, is extremely nervous about Egypt now. They haven't trained to go to war against mm -hmm. Egypt. And they say, Egypt is such a powerful army, we don't know what the outcome would be. It's very dangerous. So, um, <laughs> so if the military gains control who's hostile to Israel, I'm deeply worried. If the Muslim Brotherhood gains control who is very hostile to Israel, I'm deeply worried. So to me, there's no good solution one way or another as to uh, who is, uh, is, is, is in power. Although I guess if you force me to, to, uh, <laughs> to, to, to decide which one I would be least horrified by, I think I'd be least horrified by the military because the Muslim Brotherhood is committed to the murder of every Jew. The Koran in their Hadith, which is like the Talmud of their Koran, calls for the murder of every Jew. Mm -hmm. Seek the Jew out whether he's behind a tree or a rock and kill him. The Hamas has this as Article 7 <laughs> of their charter. Imams and sheikhs in Egypt and in the Palestinian Authority constantly invoke this passage and say so publicly, calling on the murder of every Jew. This is so, so it's not just the destruction of Israel. When you read articles in the newspaper, they'll say Hamas calls for Israel's destruction. But they never mentioned the, maybe the more horrible uh, 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 position. <laughs> they call for the murder of every Jew. And that means the three of us. These are really Arab Nazis. Now, I don't use that term lightly. I'm a child of survivors. I know what Nazis have done. I lost half my family to Hitler. <laughs> but when you call for the murder of every Jew, you're a Nazi. And that's what the Muslim Brotherhood and what Hamas uh, does. So it's Robert? very frightening. Both the military, even before Morsi took office, and Morsi himself have uh, started a rapprochement <laughs> with the regime in Iran. 
They yes. allow the warships <laughs> to go through the Suez Canal to dock in Syria. Uh -huh. And Morsi has indicated he wants to pay a visit to Iran. Is there a danger that under Morsi and his military partners, Hamas <laughs> and Hezbollah, that Israel could find itself encircled the way they did on the eve of the Six-Day War? You're speaking exactly the way the military leaders in Israel spoke to me. That's exactly right. They want to rapprush one and get closer to Iran. They, sim they share similar philosophies about all sorts of things, <laughs> especially their a hatred toward Jews and the Jewish state. <laughs> and yes, if Israel now uh, decides to uh, go after Iran simply to stop them from get getting nuclear weapons, and Iran having nuclear weapons is not the same as France or Italy <laughs> or Canada or the United States having nuclear weapons. Those countries do not publicly threaten the destruction of other countries and other people. Iran says, we're going to kill all the Jews and destroy Israel. That's why we're worried about it. So when people say, well, France has nuclear weapons, why aren't you worried about that? Because they are not a hostile, radical regime. Iran is. And the Israeli military is worried if they go after Iran, just as you said, uh, Hezbollah <laughs> in Lebanon, Hamas in Gaza, and now possibly, God forbid, Egypt, may rain terror against Israel, rockets, military invasion, and they're going to have to fight a battle on many different fronts. So this has increased dramatically the danger to invading Iran, even though they're getting nuclear weapons. I can't think of anything more dangerous to not only Israel, but to Europe and to America, because this regime has said not only will they destroy Israel, and this is not written about much, they repeatedly state we're going to destroy the big Satan, the United States of America Which as well. brings us to the November elections. <laughs> <laughs> So you've been now at the helm of ZOA through, I'm guessing, about 10 <laughs> federal election <laughs> cycles. I never... Uh, well, I almost know. 20 years. I, I feel like I'm still 46. And looking at the elections coming up, I'm guessing while you may personally have a preference on what happens, you and the organization clearly have an overriding priority to maintain strong relations between the U.S. and Israel on an ongoing basis. Yes, we do. This, this has to be very hard. Uh, in any election cycle because incumbents have a record to both <laughs> applaud and critique uh, no matter who's in who's in power while challengers may only have rhetoric um, how do you work through that during an election cycle of course the uh, never takes a public I position understand. of course on who to vote for who not to vote for but we have every legal right and obligation <laughs> to comment on policy right and we have been strong critics of Clinton's policies on Israel. People will be surprised. We were very strong critics of Bush's policies on Israel <laughs> when he publicly said, uh, when he chastised Israel for killing off Hamas leaders. If you remember, there was a period mm -hmm. in Israel. He condemned Israel for mm -hmm. that. We criticized uh, Bush for that. Uh, we criticized Bush for making a speech, the first speech by an American president endorsing a Palestinian state before mm -hmm. the Palestinians have fulfilled any of their obligations under Oslo. Mm -hmm. They didn't arrest terrorists, outlaw terrorism, stop terrorism. <laughs> accept the Jewish state, and, he, and he, he publicly accepted the Palestinian state. We criticized him, and of course, we've criticized Obama as well, regularly and repeatedly. There's not much more I can say, except, you know, we've been uh, unhappy with the, this current administration when it comes to Israel. Uh, when it comes to domestic policies, we don't get involved. That's up to other people to decide. It's up to other people to decide the, the foreign policy issues as well. <laughs> but that's the only place you take your opinion. The only place I talk about is foreign policy, especially as it affects Israel. Of course. And, uh, and we've been uh, disappointed. We've been disappointed that uh, Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden, <laughs> when Israel announced his building in eastern Jerusalem, they said we condemn this. We've never had an American president condemn Israel. They say it's unhelpful. They use diplomatic language. Never heard the word condemn. Hillary Clinton has said, that there should be no more Jews moving into Eastern Jerusalem, an astonishing racist statement of the worst sort. What do you mean? Why can Arabs be moving in East Jerusalem and not Jews? This is, even if, if uh, they end up giving it away, why can't Jews live there? <laughs> if 1.4 million Arabs can live in Israel, why can't several hundred thousand Jews live in the future state of Palestine if that would happen? And most troubling, it was reported publicly, so I can state it, at a meeting I was at with uh, President Obama in the White House a number of months ago, <laughs> he said to us that we Jewish leaders should speak to our Israeli friends and relatives and to search our souls, those are his words, to search our souls to see if we're serious about peace he doesn't think we are. <laughs> he said the Palestinian Arabs are sincere about peace. Everyone knows it. He says, you think that the uh, peace process is overrated. Things are quiet there. The economy is good. I don't think you're as serious about this uh, peace as the Palestinians are. And then he said to us, <laughs> you can keep the Jewish areas of Jerusalem. You can't keep the Arab ones. Well, what is he to now become the lawyer for the Palestinians? <laughs> 
This is between the Palestinians and Israelis, what happens with Jerusalem, one way, good or bad, right or wrong. And yet, we saw a strong bias <laughs> to, to the uh, Palestinian Arab side over the Jewish side, when Israel has been the powerful, strong, and loyal ally for years, not the Palestinian Authority. You kind of bristled when I described ZOA as being thought of, at least, <laughs> of being relatively on the right end of the spectrum vis-a-vis -vis Zionist issues and maybe J Street on the left, and you rather you kind of bristled. I wonder if you would expand for our viewers uh, on why that was push your buttons. Well, as Jerry Seinfeld would have said, uh, we are really not right-wing, even though there's nothing wrong with it. Remember, he said that about homosexuality. No, I'm not a homosexual, even though there's nothing wrong with it. That's a right. line that he used. And I answer by saying, one, we tell the truth about the situation as best we understand it. Truth is not a political position. When we say that the Palestinian Authority is not interested in peace, and we show why we have a right to make that statement, that's not a right-wing position. That's the truth. When Winston Churchill said that uh, Germany wasn't interested in peace, but only war, he was called a right-wing warmonger, and he was simply telling the truth about Germany. We are rational centrists. We've never said Israel shouldn't give away any land. In my very first speech at ZOA, back in the mid-90s, I said ZOA is not a not one-inch organization. If giving away land would bring a real peace, we would likely support it. My board would have to make the final decision, but, but I believe we would likely support it. And all we said about Oslo, we never said Oslo should end. We always said, Israel should make no concessions to the Palestinian Authority until Arafat fulfills his obligation under Oslo. He's been the terrorist his whole career. We have to, he has to show us he's going to arrest terrorists, outlaw terrorism, stop <laughs> the promotion of hatred and violence in every aspect of his culture, which Oslo required. He did none of it, and we simply said Israel should make no concessions until he shows that he's really changed. That is not a right-wing position. That's rational. I'm not going to hand my keys of my house that I sold over to the people who bought it until I see the money. I want that check, and once that clears, then I give them the house. Uh, Israel should not be making concessions until the Arabs show they're serious. And, uh, and uh, the reason we don't publicly say we support a Palestinian state is because it's premature. Be they have to do all these things first to show they're worthy of a state, that it'll be a safe and secure and civilized state, <laughs> before we, we would state that. As I tell people, we don't think we should be, have discussed, and we didn't, the Marshall Plan in 41. We're in the middle of World War II. Let's see how it turns out. Then we'll discuss a Marshall Plan, not now. We've got many things we have to do before a Marshall Plan. <laughs> so ZOA, a, a rational centrist, we take the same positions that the Labor Party under Yitzhak Rabin in 1992 took. The same positions. Everyone else has moved to the left. We've stayed in the center, and suddenly they say we're right wing because we're the right of, uh, of all the left wing. Well, you, ra you raise an interesting <laughs> question, and one we talk about a lot. And in fact, we had a public forum about, which is, which is who's within the tent of supporting Israel. And this is, you know, this is a subject of great discussion, regardless of where you are perceived to sit on the political um, spectrum. Others have posited that if you believe in the existence of a free Jewish state and are committed to its ongoing safety and security, you ought to be su considered a supporter of. Israel, regardless of your particular <laughs> tactics or politics, um, and and it feel, and it seems like there are uh, some pretty clear lines. Uh, the BDS movement appears to be outside that line, um, but but what's your thought about that? How big is the tent, and is there room for a plurality of voices within the tent to talk about tactics about how to get there? <laughs> Look, it is certainly legitimate, although I disagree with unilateral land concessions to the Palestinian Authority, mm -hmm. unilateral, mm -hmm. without getting anything in return, mm -hmm. and while they've not shown any seriousness about peace, <laughs> although I respect that it's a legitimate position where Jews can think, if you do that, maybe they'll start making concessions, maybe they'll start coming around. I don't agree with it. Mm -hmm. History for 18 years now has shown since Oswald has not happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's legitimate. But it's not legitimate to urge the President not to veto anti-Israel resolutions, mm -hmm. as J Street has done repeatedly. Uh, it's not even legitimate not to complain about the Palestinian Authority promoting uh, hatred and violence against Jews in every aspect of their culture. If you say nothing about it, you're not trying to help Israel remain safe and secure. You can't say, I love Israel, and I want it to exist in safety and security, and promote positions that harm that possibility. My wife can't say to me, I love you, and treat me horribly, and yell at me, and badmouth me, and people say, look, it's a, it's a big tent, her opinions, and she loves you. I don't need her to, to love me. That's not loving me. So simply saying I accept Israel's right to exist <laughs> uh, is, is certainly not enough uh, to say you're, you're in the tent. A big tent 
is not a, a, a tent as large as the universe. There, there are certain parameters, uh, some of which I mentioned, uh, that have to be included, but it's worthy of a significant discussion. I'd be delighted to be invited to a future panel on that discussion. Bob, you get the last question. Okay, Suha Arafat, the widow of Yasser Arafat, who <laughs> once accused, while Hillary Clinton was still <laughs> with, near her, <laughs> Israel of uh, injecting the AIDS virus, I believe, on Palestinian kids, <laughs> now wants the body of her husband <laughs> exhumed <laughs> because she claims that he was poisoned with some kind of radioactive pellet. What do, you, what do you make of that uh, story? Obviously, I don't know what the truth is. I do know it's Al Jazeera who reported this. Al Jazeera is a, is a media outlet that is breathtakingly hostile to Israel. I've been on their show many, many times. Maybe I shouldn't even go on, but I have. <laughs> Debating Arabs and, uh, and, and anti-Israel Jews, where the most vicious things against Israel are stated. So they have no credibility when it comes to an issue affecting Israel. That doesn't mean this is not true. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, Yasser Arafat uh, was known to have had a lifestyle uh, that can produce AIDS. That doesn't mean he did have AIDS or didn't. I don't know the answer to that. But the source of this uh, information is a, an organization devoted to Israel's destruction, c hates Israel, and therefore it has no credibility. And what the truth is, you know, none of us really know until... And until there be a legitimate autopsy uh, done. I cannot thank you enough, Morton, for being with us. <laughs> thank you, Bob. Thanks you. to our producer, Aggie Gallagher. <laughs> we look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.